there's a scripture verse um, that gives us a little bit of a context and a commission for why we're, we do a dedication in a place of worship with those around. And that's found in Luke 2, 27 through 36. And it's when uh, Jesus was brought to the temple by his parents in order to dedicate even the little baby Jesus. He's a pattern for us. And it's in that pattern that we're going to do this baby dedication or young child dedication. The parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took the child up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant die in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the, the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I like the fact that the scripture says of Mary, all of the things from whether it be what the angel said when she said, when he announced that she would bear a child and his name would be called Jesus or Emmanuel. She pondered all these things in her heart. And I tell you what, mothers, parents, the things that you have heard from God concerning your children, the promises that you're reaching for, the things which you have watched and seen and wondered, what will become of these little children that you love so much? As you ponder them in your heart, please respond like Mary did. Be it unto me according to your will. In other words, there was... A, a willingness to be part of the solution, even though, as we know the full story, her heart was at times crushed. Love does hurt, and opening your heart up to people will indeed at times pierce your very soul. But why don't we have those who are uh, going to be dedicating their children come up right now? Whatever side, maybe that side, whatever instructions you've been given. <laughs> What's going to happen... My, what a prolific group. <laughs> I will say no more comments lest I be in trouble. <laughs> Other than, you know, slide down just a little bit this way, tighten up so we can all get in there. Thank you, thank you. Slide down, we don't, we don't want to, okay, just push it just a little tighter. Tighter, tighter, tighter. All right. Yep, even six inches a piece would help. <laughs> so you shouldn't have eaten that pie. <laughs> anyway, beautiful, beautiful. What we're going to do is, starting one at a time, I'm going to give the mic to the parents and they can introduce themselves and their child if there's something short to say. 
say something. But we do have a message today. I just wanted to see her blush. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, the first thing I guess that popped into my mind is we were all walking in, so you don't have to clap for us. It was really fun. Uh, just, you know, I'm really happy that this church, though, still incorporates this kind of institution, if you will, uh, to dedicate um, the children to, you know, the body, which we're a part of. Um, incredibly instrumental as it is, uh, we read a lot about the prayers of the saints and the faithful and effectual prayers of the righteous availing much, and my having been dedicated in much the same way um, uh, years and years ago has been a testament to how, what a wonderful thing this is to carry on, what a wonderful tradition it is, um, being surrounded by the uh, now elderly people, being surrounded and buffeted by prayers and uh, support. Uh, it's an honor to be able to come up here and and, and follow suit. Um, Your name? Oh, Judah Anderson, uh, wife Laura Anderson. Uh, that was the debriefing. Uh, I've been gone for a minute and have, yes, I've had three children since then. Uh, Havala to my right, uh, Abigail, Jane in the middle, and Asher, uh, Ruth. Um, supposed to give a debriefing about all of them, uh, but uh, I'm sure this is you know, a mile-long line of kids, and everybody's going to have sweet things to say about their kids. Um, mine are wonderful. They all take after her. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, just honored to be able to, in this way, dedicate them without, like, pigeons and turtle doves and all that kind of thing. So. <laughs> you don't have to do a sermon like that one. Uh, my name is Nate Avey. This is my wife, Melissa, and this is our first uh, Evelyn, and she is six months old or just turned six months, and she is definitely uh, an interesting experience. <laughs> so, here you go. Hi there. Uh, Michael. This is Rachel, my wife. Klinsky. <laughs> and we are dedicating Layton, who's one, and she really wants the mic. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Hello, we're uh, the Oster Havens, and we're dedicating Addie today, Adelaide. Um, this is Nick and Annika, and Adelaide's down here. Uh, we like to call her our spunkin' pie because she's spunky when she's uh, determined to do something, like get on the stage right now. <laughs> she keeps fighting until she gets it. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, <clears throat> she's our pumpkin because she, she can look you in the eye and get you to laugh without saying a thing. And uh, she's our, our pie because she can s s come and sit in your lap and uh, it's better than a, the biggest bear hug. <laughs> so. Hi, I'm Josh Richter. This is my wife, Shayla Richter. This is our little son, our second, uh, Leon Avery Richter. Um, he's uh, just turned one years old, and he's about as bald as the day he was born. That's, uh, that's about it. <laughs> Taylor and Alicia Stonehouse. This is our third Beckham Reed, and he has added a lot of flavor to our family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like a lot. Um, but we love him, and uh, he fits right in, so. Hello, Joel and Kelsey Studebaker. This is Ezekiel Tate, and he's number six. We kind of call him our, our second bonus boy. We originally wanted two of each, but God has given us more. And uh, he's a mama's boy. Uh, I'm Paul Studebaker. This is my wife, Sophia, and this is our daughter, Noelle Christine. So we now have uh, Regal, Christiana, and Noelle Christine, kind of keeping the theme consistent, making the center of our life the center of their names. So, um, yeah, we're, she's a very smiley baby. She's always smiling until she's tired, and then she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm James Van Harn. This is my wife, Laura, and this is Michael Craig, our second. Uh, very, very yeah. blessed. Uh, I've been going to this church for the last 20 plus years, and many of you have uh, walked through a lot of journeys and trials with me that I am so blessed and thankful to have you be a part of my life as the body of Christ. Um, you know, a wife of noble character who can find, and I have. I'm so thankful and so blessed, and uh, God has been so incredibly faithful, and uh, just want to encourage you, no matter what you're going through, keep your eyes on Jesus. Hello, my name, hello, my name is Ian Veenstra. This is my wife, Anna Veenstra, and our little princess, Abigail, Abigail Joanne. Um, I just want to say that I'm thankful to be a part of this church. We're kind of new members, but the Bible says that uh, children are like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior. So I plan on having many of them. <laughs> so, uh, I'm so blessed, though, to be a part of this, and I thank you. <laughs> he beat you to it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how straight they all fly, but uh, <laughs> if I can remember this one's name, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is Boaz. He's our number nine. My wife told me I couldn't make any crude jokes, only praise her. Um, so he came out, he was 12 pounds, and as if she didn't have enough street credit as it was for her mother. But it's kind of funny, you know, if you're a doctor, people, when they're sick, they, you know, they come to you. If you have a lot of kids, they think that's like your expertise, and everybody's always asking you, you know how that happens? And, um, and I'm like, we need some kind of classes. Even some sweet old lady came up to me the other day. I told her, and I, I'm like, at your age, I I've never been slapped so hard in my life, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, we won't, uh, we won't go there. God's, God's telling me not to say the joke. I'm Wade's cousin, Paul. This is my wife, Brittany. Uh, we're dedicating Maverick. Uh, Goose is uh, coming out in uh, September. Um, Maverick uh, was named after my dad, Rick, uh, who I had a lot of respect for, a um, godly man that I hope this boy right here grows up to be. Wow is right. What we are going to do right now, Mary wondered and Joseph wondered what would be the destiny of their child. We know what that destiny is. But God has a destiny for each of these little ones. And God will give the wisdom and grace to each one of you as you raise them in the fear of the Lord. And that is what we're going to do as you are giving back to God that which he has given to you. We are going to pray for you together as a congregation. If you'd stand up and put your hands forward in blessing over this army equipped with mighty arrows, all right? Oh, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint not only these little children and lead them up and protect them in the ways of righteousness, but also equip the parents with the discernment, the provision and wisdom of every sort to be able to bring them to the place where you want these child to be. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And all you kids, you did wonderful. It's such a blessing to see all of you come forward and dedicate your children to give back to him that which means the most to you. And you can be assured that God's going to equip you with everything that you need. Uh, I love the scripture verse. It says in 2 Timothy 2, 12, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him against that day. It's such a privilege and honor for us to be 
part of your dedication service here. For some of these parents, it was a little bit scary standing up here. But you'll find as parents, you're going to face things that are a lot more scary than this. And I'm not, guys, I'm not talking about what you may have to change sometime. Having a child has changed their perspective on life. Having a child placed in their arms, everything is different. The world changed with that. And uh, that's a good thing. It's a God thing, and it's something that causes us to look up and call out for help to God because we need for added wisdom and strength as the immensity of the responsibility that falls on our shoulder for a moment causes our knees to be weak and go, oh, what do I do? I... <laughs> When you get to that point, that's a good thing. That's a God thing. Because you will need to have a Father in heaven who is available to give you the strength and wisdom to be able to lead these kids. Uh, Lowell Grissel, one of our very prolific members of this church, came to me after having his first child. His name was Cyrus. And I think, Cyrus, you're on the board right now, right? Turn around, look at Cyrus there and wave. All right? You know? He was concerned. He and his wife, Sarah, were going, this is, this is so much. I, I don't know if I could handle and have another child. You know? And I remember saying to him what I felt the Holy Spirit give me. You got this all wrong, Lowell. You think this is too much for you and you won't be able to handle another child? You're doing this wrong. You're, it's on your shoulders. You think you're going to do this. You, this is too much for you. You, are, you need God's help. And do you know what? The very fact that that young man is sit, sitting in the back there ministering and serving this body shows that God came through for Lowell and Sarah Crisell. But not only that, how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, I currently have two older adopted brothers and two younger brothers. Wow. So in other words, your parents actually did foster care too, right? Yes, sir, they did. Because they found out that they are not able to handle this, but God is. And that's what I want you, the takeaway of this message, if you have nothing else, God is the one that's the element in your family that allows you to be able to do what God called you to do. The world your children are being born into is a scary place. And it presents several challenges. Some of the challenges that parents face right now is economic. Some of it is social influences. Some of it is spiritual training. And in all of these areas, God is the answer. God is the one who will give you what you need to as a parent to raise your children. The world has changed so much and we'll start with the easy one, financial. The economic pressure that you're going to face. Some of you think, you know, I can't afford this child. I can tell you, with the first child I had, I did not think I could afford one child. But I found that God has met my needs. And as I went to God and sought the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, because that's the instruction that the Holy Spirit gave my wife and I. If you seek first to serve him and do what he called you to do, everything else that you need in life, he will give you the power and the enablement for. God will meet the needs of anyone who puts Christ as the center of their life. The scripture verse that that's found in is Matthew 6, 31 through 34. It's a familiar one. But parents need to know this. Don't worry then saying, what will we eat? Or 
what will we drink or what will you wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, in other words, the world eagerly seeks all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all the other things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Not that the future is going to do that, but you might as well treat it that way, because God is the one who holds the future. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There it is again. Keep reminding us that in this world you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If you are waiting till you can afford to have children, you will never have them. Children cost more than any one of us can afford. And I'm not just talking financially. The expense to you emotionally is more than you can afford. But God gives you provision. Can I have any blessed mother say amen? Amen. Men, take them out on dates. <laughs> or pay some babysitter. Or if a grandparent, just bring them on over. <laughs> but those who are blessed with children are the richest in the world. Whether it be something that came from your own womb or God has get put in your life that you need to disciple and parent. God takes the solitary and puts them in families. And some of you are fathers and mothers of Israel. Those that have a call in your life. Just because you're no longer childbearing age doesn't mean that we aren't producing and nurturing new life. Can I have an amen from all of us who've already been way past that? God has a call for us to be parents and to lead people in righteousness. The second is the social influences in life. And you need to prepare your children for the reality that, you know, in this world, they're not always going to be accepted because this world does not love or follow God. And they will often reject those who do. Have any of you noticed that? You're being canceled. Our worldview is not acceptable, not only in the media, it's not acceptable among many of our friends. You will find out that you will be rejected just like Jesus was rejected if you choose to teach your children and follow God's ways. But you need to brace yourself for that rejection and buoy it up with the acceptance that God gives you. And sadly to say, not that you're going to end up freaking your children out, not that you're going to put fear in them, but at a certain point, and nowadays it's getting younger and younger and younger, you're going to have to prepare them for the fact that they will be rejected because they're following Jesus. Sad stuff to say, John 15, 18, and 21. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Because they do not know the one who sent me. Brace your children for reality. We don't teach them that a Santa Claus, God is Santa Claus in the sky. Or that there's all the things the world presents that's a fairy tale. You prepare them at the right age to handle reality. That means don't spoil them. Lead them in righteousness and tell them to answer with grace and kindness when they are assaulted by the world. You will also need to make sure they know that they are loved and feel secure in the way that God made them. Amen? Their identities are placed on them by God. And they are reinforced by you, the parent. In Psalm 139, it says that, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Your children need to know that they are made just the way God loves them 
and they accept that and go on from there. And I love the, in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, that's usually attributed to all of us who are older, but it also applies to every human that is embraced by God because we have received his grace. But you are a chosen people. God chose you. A royal priesthood. Ah, that's what you're aspiring to be. To, to be what God says you are. A holy nation. He looks at you as holy. God's special possession. I think that you need to tell your children they are God's special possession. When they feel unloved, let them know God looks at them specially, and they are special to him. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Isn't that wonderful to know? And it's so important that we imprint that on our children and reinforce it. Very few parents feel qualified for the task, but God will help you. You can do it. And if ever there's a place to pull that scripture verse that all of us quote all the time, now's the place to quote it. In Philippians 4 verse 13, say it with me loudly. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is a verse that is so much a treasured and a promise that God says to us as we try to parent these precious little ones. If you wait until you feel qualified, you will never have kids. It's a learn-as-you-go thing, and it's different with each child. How many who have gone through that have found it? You, you raised the first one, and, you, and you're going, you know what? I read the books. I watched the video. I even got a T-shirt. And uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Little Susie, a little angel. And, of course... My husband, oh, praise God, but my husband and I, we did all the things that the book said. And uh, we didn't even have to spank. We believe in it. But bless God and the children of the righteous, you know, and if you do it right, it's going to turn out just perfect. <laughs> You're pregnant? Oh, it's a little boy. It could be a little girl, too, but... The next time, baby dedication, you don't even want to show up. <laughs> you know that little thing on the thing that tells what parents' kids getting bad and has to be called out of the thing? Or the, or, or the one that elders are hearing, you know, I'd like to come to church, but the kid screams louder than I do. That's your second child. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all your competence went out the window. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Please, parents, be very thankful when you got an easy one. <laughs> and very humble. And pray with no judgment on those who have a little bit more of a firebrand that later on will shock and rock the world for Jesus. Because you have disciplined them, and you did use a spanking stick, and you had to keep your attitude right, not smile while you did it. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not, I, I, you mean you sometimes, no, you, no, you're holy, you're holy. I'm just going to go on. I tell parents there's only one thing you need to do to successfully raise a child. And right before they write me off, I quickly say, it's a miracle. And you need a miracle for each of your children. But God is in the miracle business, and I have seven miracles that are now adults. And you get better at believing for miracles with practice. And that's why I continue to have children, and I thank God for it. But seriously, parenting is serious business. It, and the most important of all of these things that we're trying to instill in our children, that we are in 
commissioned and called to teach them is the spiritual training. The spiritual training. You teach your children how to live for Christ by the way that you live for Christ. More is caught than taught. We say it all the time. Watch what you do because they certainly are watching what you do. You have such a short time. It was a blink of the eye when I first heard the babies cry till the fact that they now actually have asked me if I have all my effects in order and I have my, uh, you know, make sure to clean the garage. I don't want to have to do it when you're gone. <laughs> my mother told me a, a poem when I was young and I thought it bore repeating. She said, my little daughter tumbled off my knee and skipped off to school. A tall young lad saunters home with her. Their child brings me my shawl and stool. Quick, in a moment. Your time with your children is short. Do not skip ahead. Fast forward one moment of it, but take advantage of it. It has a profound effect on who they will be. They'll either live a lifetime of gratitude or resentment for what you have taught them by your example. My mom passed 10 years ago and my father passed 46 years ago when I was 19. And I still often think as I face things in life, what would they do? What would he do? What would my mom do? What would my father do? Teach always and use words if necessary. And my, I have to thank God that my godly parents taught me well. Proverbs 1, verse 8 through 9 says, Listen, my son, all you young people, you can save yourself a lot of grief. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions. And do not forsake the teachings of your mother, for they are a garland of grace on your head and a pendant around your neck. It's important to teach your children to learn. How? By learning yourself. Are you listening? Are you continuing to learn, or do you think you have it all figured out? I trust that each of you parents today are in full learn mode. Full learn mode. Ears wide open. Even writing down a tip or two that you intend to apply. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. But there is something every diligent parent needs to know, even if you provided, protected, and trained them flawlessly in the way that they should go. That alone will not secure your children's future, not in this life, nor in the next. You're going, Kelvin, I thought you're preaching the Word of God. Are you contradicting that promise in the Scripture? Proverbs 22, verse 6, is a proverb. It is not a promise. It's a book of truths. Yes, godly truths. It's that negates your child's free will and automatically guarantees that they will make you proud or even get them to heaven. Proverbs 22, verse 6, is a truth. Something that you should aspire to do as a parent. Do your part with what God has put in front of you. Our hope for our children is not in our faithfulness as parents. Some of you are going, I am so glad to hear that. It is in the faithfulness 
of our Father in heaven and his ability to lead them to salvation. The Old Testament revealed God's covenant to his people, Abraham's seed. And God said to Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations. In the New Testament, in Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul expounds on this fact that we who believe have been grafted into this Abrahamic root and thereby become beneficiaries of God's covenant blessing. Aren't you glad that God has grafted us into the promises he has made for his children, the children of Israel? Uh, well, but salvation only comes by repentance from sin and turning by faith to God. But God commits himself. He has made a covenantal commitment to set your children aside for special attention, intending to bring them to their own place of decision. Wow. In Acts 2, 37 through 42, when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, went down into the, into the square after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he preached a message. They said, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, each one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we had the privilege of baptizing many in the lake. How many were at the service there? Wasn't that awesome? It's online if you want to see it. It's a, a, a response to their own personal acceptance of the gift of salvation. That is how salvation came, by personally accepting God doesn't have grandchildren, but he makes commitment to your children and grandchildren. And I'll explain. But the scripture goes on in Acts 2, 37 through 42, and saying, For the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Did God call you to himself? Are you far off not only in space but in time? He, that promise is for you. God says that he will be a covenant-keeping God. But what does that look like? What does that mean? God has made precious promises to us that give peace to believing parents. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, and this is speaking about families that one is a believer, the other is not a believer. We already know in the context of Scripture that you can't get saved for someone else. Some of you are married to unbelieving husbands or unbelieving wives. And you go, God, what about my children? Are these promises that you have made, uh, do I, can I trust you in this? Well, 1 Corinthians 7, 14 explains it. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified or set apart. He even is made as a special case that God, for his love for you, is going to send the Holy Spirit to work on him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified or set apart through his wife because she's made saved. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified or set apart through her believing husband. For otherwise, your children are unclean, 
but now they are holy, set apart. In other words, if you are a believing parent, those promises of, of God that he will pursue your children, God considers such a child clean. It doesn't mean that they are sinless. It would negate all of what the scripture says. We have to interpret scripture with scripture. God has promised and is committed to leading and driving them to a truth that they can accept. And that should be a great comfort to every one of us flawed parents. How many of you are flawed parents? You have God as your back. I myself know the blessing and discipline of being a child that was dedicated to God by parents. As a child, I was blessed with their love and their instruction. I was taught by the word of God in the home and by their godly example. But when I was old enough to choose, I went my own way. I tasted sin in many different flavors. And though it felt good in the t on the tongue and in the mouth, it rotted in the belly. My parents' faith could not save me. But God's covenant promises to be a God to me because my parents' commitment to him, it released the hounds of heaven on this delinquent child. Remember that, the hounds of heaven. The angels that have your scent. Because God said, this one is, is a child of mine. And you go chase after their prodigy and their generations. I've made commitments Please don't resist the Holy Spirit if you are a child that is delinquent, running from God, having your own appetite for sin in this world. Because I tell you what, it will rot in the belly, and, you will, and when you rot in the grave, you will not be in heaven if you continue to follow your own desires. But if you listen to, heed the voice of a parent, a godly parent, maybe a grandparent, and those who've loved you in the Lord enough to be able to speak the truth to you, warning you of the direction you're going, please respond to that invitation. Do not resist the Holy Spirit, but come home to God because you have a Father who loves you. The scent of my believing parents' spiritual DNA was put underneath the nose of the bloodhounds of heaven, and they pursued me, and I couldn't get away with nothing. All my friends, or the ones that I shouldn't have been hanging out with, could get away with sin. I'd get, I'd do a step, as soon as I step into trouble, boop, somehow they, I got caught. How unfair is that? God, are you against me? No, I'm for you. I'm catching you. I got your scent, boy, and you are going to have to face the fact that you got a praying mom and a praying dad. Proverbs 22 is a powerful truth that you should rest in. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, be, don't be too quick to lose your hope and say it didn't work. Those of you who have children and grandchildren that are lost, because I've seen way too many prodigal sons and daughters come home. And be again embraced by their heavenly father and moms and dads and grandfathers. Have faith in God's power and persuasive tactics. Have faith in his parenting. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. And forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. He took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. It's recorded in Luke 18, verse 16. I want to comfort you today in the fact that God loves your children more than you do. You do your part. God will do his. You train them. Trust him to save them. Would you stand up? After this message of encouragement and challenge,
I'm going to pray a blessing on you parents who are struggling because you feel like the job is too big for you. But you acknowledge that, you know, at times I try to do it myself and, it, and, and I come to the end of myself quickly and I am just worn out. But I so want to have the provision of God. I want to have the mindset of trusting God that he will do his part when I have done everything. So I want us to, with every head bowed, every head bowed, just put, put your hand up if you're a parent that really wants to have a, a fresh in, in a in a word from God that says, yes, I see you and I will give you what you need to raise these children. Put your hand up. I, there should be many parents because I know many of you are overwhelmed. That's, I'm not going to ask you to come up here. But you're believing for children and grandchildren. All right. Lord, I just pray right now that your spirit would fill them with faith and trust in your word, not in their competency, but in your competency, 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 oh God. Not in their own strength, but in your unlimited power to save. We right now, in your own mind, bring to mind, if you have to whisper the name of children that you want to bring before the Lord, children and grandchildren that need a touch from you, that need to come home, that need to experience the salvation that is offered. Whisper that. Think, bring it to your mind. God hears these things. Oh God, as these parents and grandparents have mentioned and brought to mind those that they love and care for, you, oh Lord, care for them more. Would you send the hounds of heaven to chase down the lost sheep, the prodigal sons and daughters. Bring them to a place of no option but to surrender to Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would protect their lives as their lives fall apart and come to the, the place of knowing there is no one else to go to but God. I ask this in faith. And with joy, knowing that when I pray in agreements with your word that you say you wish that no one uh, would be lost, that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I pray, dear God, that, that there would be a, a wonderful reunion, not only in heaven, but here on earth, because of these lost sheep and prodigals coming back home. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, all right, make sure that you... Wish your mother's happy Mother's Day today. Maybe do the dishes or... I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability. 